I just want to say a few words as to why the Kitchener camp was the place where German refugees first joined the British Army. As you probably know, the Central British Fund for German Jewry funded and managed and ran the Kitchener camp, which was a refugee camp, mostly for men coming straight out of concentration camps in Germany, three concentration camps, Dachau, Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald. Um, and they came to Sandwich courtesy of the Central British Fund and it was run a camp run by Jews and in fact we have the son of Jonas May who was the director of the Kitchener camp and the nephew of Phineas May who kept this wonderful diary which I use in the book um, and uh, every man got sixpence a week pocket money it wasn't a luxurious life in any way at all and by um, October 1939 after war had broken out um, the Central British Fund had basically run out of money and they were absolutely desperate to get the men off their hands and when the opportunity arose, when the British government started to talk to the Central British Fund about this group of German-speaking Jews who had all been assessed, bar two, as friendly aliens, not enemy aliens, by seven tribunals that had come to Sandwich to assess them, um, it seemed obvious that this was a very useful resource. They were all men, therefore suitable for the military, they were all young or youngish, uh, and they were all anti the enemy, with reason, very good reason, and um, they wanted to fight. So it was clear that here was a resource that could be used. Um, and the, the panjandrums of, of the um, Central British Fund were very keen indeed to persuade these men to enlist and in fact they produced um, a little poster or, or leaflet and I'm just going to read a few words of it to you and now the opportunity has arrived for all refugees to repay the debt they owe to England and the way they can do it is by standing shoulder to shoulder with their English brothers whether Jewish or Christian to take up the work whatever it may be and to share the responsibility and the burden which has been thrust upon this country and then in huge capitals there is no conscription all join up as volunteers and then back to lowercase, we have no doubt as to what your decision will be. On the contrary, we know, and then again in capitals, you will do your duty. <laughs> so they hoped with this leaflet that the men would join. And indeed, when Lord Reading, who had been Viceroy of India and um, was himself a Jew, um, turned up at the Bell Hotel in Sandwich to command the Pioneer Corps that was being established at Kitchener Camp in November 1939, many of them flocked to enlist. It then took some time to organize them. In the event, by the time that they were organized into platoons and corps, um, about 1,200 men in the Kitchener camp did not enlist, but the majority did. But the point about the Pioneer Corps was, although these men had been identified as friendly aliens, the Pioneer Corps was not armed, and I'm sure Helen will, will talk about that. They weren't trusted, basically, to kill Germans. Um, the Pioneer Corps um, was mainly for logistics, um, digging latrines um, uh, and supporting the Royal Engineers in building bridges and so on. <coughs> so um, the Pioneer Corps training camp was established at Kitchener. The men who had not enlisted serviced the Pioneer Corps and um, part of the effort of the Central British Fund after Christmas 1938-9 was to keep the men who hadn't enlisted in the camp so they would keep doing the work to service the Pioneer Corps. 
Um, and it was, they did that with difficulty and with real authoritarianism to, to keep them there. Um, in May 1940, after the fall of France, um, the camp was closed and people were transported, um, the men were transported either to the Isle of Man, where those that hadn't enlisted were interned, or to the West Country, where they, they joined Pioneer Corps units in um, Ilfra Coombe and name another place, Helen, in Devon. Biddeford. Biddeford. <laughs> Sorry. It was about 20 something, yeah, about 20 years ago. I'd done quite a lot on Anglo Jewish history in the 18th century, 19th century, and somebody came up to me after I'd been involved in an exhibition and said, What have you done? And I did quite a lot, I mean, it sounds very obscure, but it was just a hobby to start with, on uh, the Jews of Devon and Cornwall. And somebody said to me, What have you done about the Jews? who were in North Devon. And I'm going to come back to Kitchener Camp, don't worry. What have I done about the Jews in North Devon in the wartime? Well, I hadn't done anything. So I was fascinated. Uh, and I put out a notice, part of one in the AJR, and I think something even went in the Jewish Chronicle in those days, asking for anyone who'd had any links with North Devon in World War II. And of course, I, you know, my husband would come home and I'd say, oh, I got a couple of letters today from evacuees, Jewish evacuees. I had another couple of letters, a couple of refugees who, you know, again, were at school in North Devon. And my husband said, oh, and I got up to about 12. And my husband said, you've got enough for an article. And then he came home one day, and people thought I was completely crazy. He came home one day and I said, 3,000. And he said, you've got enough for a book. And all the rest is history, because I'm still writing the refugee stories that started here. It's just crazy, but incredibly important. And I hope to give you a little bit of an insight into that. And some of you have brought the book with you this evening, Jews in North Devon in the Second World War. And people really did think I'd lost it. When, but it became Devon Book of the year so it's not not a bad achievement but uh, what started me off then was yes that first inquiry and how would I get to those through roughly 3,000 veterans or maybe more who were in North Devon and of course most of them were living where Golders Green, where I come from. So I very quickly started to network and uncovered an incredible largely untold story. I mean, Peter Leighton Langer did something on the king's own loyal enemy aliens, but largely untold story. And it does start, as Claire said, in the Kitchener camp. And towards the end of 1939, as we know, some of the men, 200 of them, came over as craftsmen. And many of those would then go on and serve in the Pioneer Corps. So the British government, the one or two uh, who I interviewed, who at the outbreak of war said we volunteered immediately but the government said we've got nothing for you go away you're you're German. So they said, we're not German, we're ex-refugees, we're stateless. But whatever their identity and how they saw themselves, they could not enlist. And they very much felt that this was their war. And that is a thread, a very important thread through this story. So uh, the men that were in the Kitchener camp then were given the opportunity of enlisting, as Claire said, under uh, the command of Lord Reading. We have a, a nice photograph of some of them there just relaxing in Kitchener camp and in the early part of 1940 they had around well they had six companies that were formed and five of them actually were sent to France to help the British Expeditionary Force and they were affectionately known as the King's most loyal enemy aliens. <laughs> given the king's shilling, uh, or most of them uh, through, through that period, were given the king's shilling and swore allegiance to George VI. And as Claire said, they were, and it's true for the, those that joined the Pioneer Corps the next six months to a year, uh, they could not be conscripted. They were all volunteers. And I personally think that is extraordinary. And they became one of 10, they became part of 10,000 German Jewish refugees, men and women. There were about a thousand women. I can't talk about them tonight, unfortunately, but you know, they could stay within my brief. But there were 10,000 German 
largely Jewish, about 90% of them were Jewish, refugees who served in the British forces and went on to make the most extraordinary contribution, most of which started in the Pioneer Corps. That, and one, that's one in seven of the refugees that came here, roughly, uh, served in the British forces, for which, if you ask anybody in the public domain, the, the Germans fighting for Britain, uh, it's a largely still, I think there's a danger we could forget the story, but we mustn't. So, uh, the picture here of some of the craftsmen in the middle there, Harry Rosney, who I interviewed a lot uh, during uh, his lifetime and gave much colour. He was a poet, uh, later uh, also a sign writer, but he wrote a lot of very moving poems about escaping from Berlin and joining in the British army. And there we have Hans Jackson, another chap I interviewed, who's done a whole series of drawings, uh, again, uh, with regard to the Pioneer Corps in Kitchener Camp. So, <laughs> I love this. I'm trying to work out what they're holding. It looks like ice creams, but it's not, not ice creams. But there are some gems. I don't know if Claire's seen this photograph. There are some gems. There's still lots of stuff in family archives. But as I said, in that early part of 1940, six companies were formed of around 350 men. Five of them were sent to France. The other one was sent around the country, primarily in and out of London, clearing bomb damage. But one of the things that constantly, the constant thread through all the interviews I did with the veterans, when they were in the Pioneer Corps, they were thoroughly frustrated that they were basically doing uh, work of the Labour Corps in a sense, and they were not allowed to fight proper. And that strong feeling, number one, that this was their war, and number two, that they wanted to give something back to Britain for saving their lives, is another very strong strand. And they felt frustrated, as I said, of being in the Pioneer Corps, effectively digging for victory. And a largely and documented story of Kitchener Camp, and I don't know if Claire's found any more information, but Hans Jackson that I uh, mentioned, in the very first part of, of enlisting in the wartime, they had a very tiny listening station in Hague Camp across the road there. And apparently they, they were listening into um, stuff which would be fed into Bletchley Park. But again, that would be worth pursuing, a, a hidden story. There were just a handful of them that did that, and that's Hans Jackson's sketch. So another um, photograph taken in Kitchener Camp. I'm trying to identify on there, uh, in the middle there somewhere, is Bill Howard. It's a bit weird at this angle. He's still around, actually. He's about 98 now. Uh, as you know, the eyewitnesses to this period are go have gone, basically. I just have two or three veterans left who really aren't up to being interviewed on TV or radio anymore from those 10,000 that served, the men and the women. You know, we are losing the eyewitnesses and the stories that come with it. So five companies then in France in that early part of 1940, guarding uh, the crossroads, etc whilst uh, the Germans eventually would advance. But one of the things they were required to do when they joined, and all of your father's uncles you know, would have done, would be to sign this declaration. Some of you might recognise this declaration. I certify that I understand the risks to which I and my relatives may be exposed by my employment in the British Army outside the United Kingdom. Notwithstanding this, I certify that I am willing to be employed in any theatre of war. And when those that were going abroad, when I said abroad, in, into France, were encouraged, and really the British Army insisted as much as possible that they would anglicise their name, I'm sure uh, you're aware of that. The only, one of the few people who didn't, and it comes in later in the story, was Anton Walter Freud, because he reckoned that because Freud's literature had been banned in, in 1933, by the time he went back, parachuted back into Austria, no one ever knew who Freud was. <laughs> but he refused to change his name. He said, I left as a Freud and I'm going back as a Freud. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, 
But Harry Rosny, you know, one of the privileges, you know the basic story, I think, of the Pioneer Corps, and I will outline some bits, but one of the things that the privilege of having in interviewing veterans themselves is getting an understanding, I suppose, for want of a better word, of the emotional side of why they've enlisted, which I've already mentioned, giving something back to Britain. But he said, you know, uh, we thought the, the English were mad at this time because they didn't know really what they were facing. And this is a quote from Harry when I interviewed him. England, he said, at that hour was the hope of the world of freedom and tolerance. We clung to its apron, blessing the day we were allowed to set foot on it, albeit on a temporary visa. But, he said, had the English actually known, as the refugees did, the terrible tortures and ordeals in store for them, should the Germans be able to get a foothold in these islands, they too might have lost their heads and given in before the struggle for life and death was actually to take place. And this is the last part of his quote. It so happened that their ignorance of the true danger coupled with their nerve saved the world from the terror of Nazi domination. And he said England could resist only because the English had no idea what they were resisting nor how heavy the dice was loaded against them. And that's how he felt, uh, you know, would it be possible uh, for Britain standing alone uh, to win the war? And then ultimately, of course, uh, with America coming into the war, things change. Parallel to this story then, we've got those five companies in France. We've got a number of uh, men enlisting and training still in Kitchener camp. But of course, when the mass internment comes in May, June 1940, uh, a number of things happen. The nature eventually of those who join the Pioneer Corps are different. Those that have joined in Kitchener camp are, are largely, for want of a better word, newly arrived refugees. Those that enlist later have often studied or worked in Britain from as early as 1933. Their English is much better and they have integrated uh, into society perhaps a little bit more. More photographs here. This is one of the field kitchens. Uh, oops. Oh, we've got a blank one then. But one of the characters that we follow through, does anybody recognise this chap? I know he's Coco, I remember him in the early 70s, you know, he did the traffic crossings for kids, you know, how to safely cross, he did the adverts, I think for which he got an OBE or something, or CBE. So one of the uh, amazing stories actually is about Coco the Clown, and apparently the story goes that he turned up, I'll come back to the pioneers that are still left abroad, don't worry, uh, he turned up at Euston to enlist, his real name is Nikolai Pavlyakov, they didn't know what to do with him, so they sent him down, this is what the story goes, they sent him down to Kitchener camp with the refugees. And the story goes, when he turned up, Lord Reading would, well, when anyone enlist, enlisted, would find out if they had any particular skills. And those that would join the Pioneer Corps in Kitchener camp, a lot of them were highly skilled. You know, you had a microcosm of German and Austrian society. So you had architects and dentists and, you know, you had people like Rudy Hertz, who was a very distinguished architect. And apparently they built the roads better in Kitchener camp than any Englishman could have done. I love it. So uh, when Pavlikov uh, went before Lord Reading, Lord Reading said, and what's your particular skill? And he said, I'm a clown. He said, I'm going to say, get out, you know. <laughs> and then he thought, hang on a minute, what if he's telling the truth? And he was, and of course he said, okay, back, back, come back. You really are a clown, says Pavlikov's story. And uh, yes, so he would then head the entertainment corps, for want of a better word, and enlisted musicians and uh, actors and stuff. And they raised a lot of money for the war effort uh, during their time around Kitchener camp, but also in North Devon. So he would follow uh, in the story. There he is, and uh, in the there next to to one of the girls at one of the performances. So 
this lady's father's in the photograph on the end there, amazing. So May, June 1940, the mass internment, as we know, of uh, German Jewish refugees around the country, nearly 30,000, 27 to 30,000, find themselves in the Isle of Man. But something else happens actually. Kitchener Camp, as Claire has uh, hinted, uh, was evacuated. You couldn't have German speaking refugees right down there on the coast because of the worry of fifth columnists. And in fact, they did eventually catch two spies in a dinghy uh, off Dungeness, for example. Uh, so, and they tried to turn them to work for us, not, not Jewish. So there really was a fear, the invasion fear. And along with the mass internment, the, those that were training in the Pioneer Corps and Kitchener Camp were moved overnight by train. They didn't know where they were going because all the notices had been taken down and they went right across the country. Anybody know where they turned up? That's a good guess, Ilfracombe. Just one step before Ilfracombe, they ended up, where would you, where would you take your refugees? Refugees in, in, training in the army with Coco the Clown. He was a Dartmoor. And it was May 1940, and for nine weeks, apparently, it did not stop raining. And they were intense on Dartmoor, and they petitioned Lord Reading, uh, petition after petition, uh, to move from uh, Dartmoor, but uh, to no avail for nine weeks. And what I like is the continental humour, those stories which come out, and apparently Coco tells of the occasion where he, he got out in the night, and basically you just have to use a hedge. And he noticed the next morning that somebody had chalked on the side of the tent Ritz Hotel <laughs> so continental humor uh, and they even managed uh, I interviewed uh, their rabbi they even managed uh, late Levy Isaac Levy they even managed a kosher kitchen for those Orthodox soldiers and could you set up a kosher kitchen on Dartmoor today I mean how did they manage it in the middle of the wartime but they did we won't go into the logistics but lots of these stories and because the morale was pretty low concern about relatives that were left behind in Nazi Germany um, Coco did his best to entertain the men and there were stories of him pouring buckets of water over himself in the tent, in the, in the uh, naffy tent etc. But eventually they moved around the coast to Biddeford and that's where 165 Company, I know 137, Westwood Ho and Biddeford were formed. Now, in the meantime, we had, there was a problem, of course, with those five pioneer companies in France. And they were brought back. They said, the ones that I interviewed said they were amongst the last to be evacuated as late as the 27th of June 1940. And they really did wonder if they would be evacuated. And Bill Howard, who I showed you in the previous, I can't pick him out immediately on the... <coughs> oh, it's way back. Oh, no, I'm not going to go way back. Uh, Bill Howard talked about the French being very cross with them for abandoning them, you know, and hissing and spitting and shouting at them. And he said he turned around to one of them and said, we will be back. Amazing, we will be back. Uh, and he was back uh, later in the wartime. So they were eventually as they evacuated, apparently all of them were brought back and they were sent to Westwood Ho where they regrouped. And over the summer of 1940, Eleanor Rathbone, I love this, look at the pioneers in front of Marks and Spencers, we've got to have that one in the presentation. Uh, over the summer of 1940, Eleanor Rathbone petitioned Parliament and said it's ridiculous, you know, to, to keep these uh, internees on the Isle of Man. Some of them, as one of you mentioned to me earlier about your relative, had been transported on the Dunera, some to Canada actually, on the Arundora Star that was sunk, but uh, 2,000 were sent to Australia on the Dunera. One of them, Sigmund Freud's grandson, Walter Freud. So um, from there, they would eventually enlist. So, but over the summer then, Eleanor Rathbone had petitioned Parliament and eventually around September, some were released in September 1940. How could they get early release from the Isle of Man? By enlisting in the British Army. 
and in specifically of course the only unit open to them being the pioneer corps and so they swore allegiance to George VI same as the earlier ones had uh, and found themselves transferred from the Isle of Man to you're right, Ilfracoom. And I found a fellow person who was born in Ilfracoom, and like myself. Not that I grew up there, but I was there for a short time. So Ilfracoom incredibly becomes this microcosm, this Victorian seaside becomes a microcosm of German and Austrian society. And there's a, the Vic, one of the Victorian buildings behind. I believe this might be 165 Company. I'd have to double check a 74 company on the corner of the high street there. So it becomes a microcosm of German and Austrian society. A university was formed, they're square bashing on the seafront, and interestingly, they didn't experience any anti Semitism. But what they did experience was anti German feeling. And of course, the local lasses would love to see these smart men in uniform up and down the seafront, particularly on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> All they were doing was square bashing. And of course, the fathers were furious. You're not going out with any B German because, you know, I fought in the First World War and to keep away. Uh, there is a one funny story that Winnie Fields told that uh, there was one of their fellow uh, refugees in the army who was so tall, quite a burly guy, quite large burly very tall and they didn't have a uniform that fitted him from the stores so while they were waiting for his uniform to arrive there he was marching up and down and Willie heard one of the locals say these guys are good they've caught a German already <laughs> so lots and lots of colorful stories like that there they are uh, marching or about to march uh, in Ilfracoom lots of stories of pioneers getting thoroughly frustrated, wanting to fight. Walter Freud's father, Martin, he was Sigmund Freud's eldest son, found himself in the Osborne Hotel just peeling potatoes. He'd had a life as a prominent Viennese lawyer, found himself peeling potatoes in the Osborne Hotel. Not his idea of fighting Hitler. And some of them uh, found themselves in the orchestra, etc., and working with Coco the Clown, putting on, this is a production of Cinderella in um, uh, Ilfracoom. Quite some, you know, very, very rare photographs. So after they'd received their training, they would be sent out around the country doing all sorts of stuff as we know mixing concrete basically filling pits whatever building nissen huts barbed wire defenses guarding the docks etc uh, and as i say for the next two or three years really wanting to make a difference and this chap on the left sir ken adam when he was in ilfracoom started to um, court the colonel's daughter. Not a, not a good idea. It was Colonel Coles by that point. <laughs> and uh, Colonel Coles caught him not uh, with his daughter out gallivanting rather than doing his training of fellow refugees. And he called him, interesting, and said one day, Adam, was it the, did you have an application sent off? Yes, he said, I've been trying to get into the Royal Air Force. And he became the only German known German fighter pilot in the RAF. How did he manage it? Because the colonel said, send off that application again. And within two weeks, he'd moved to Scotland. <laughs> for his training but the long and the short of it is he he had the most distinguished career with 609 squadron incredibly dangerous and after the war he went on to create some of the James Bond he was a production designer he did over 70 films he designed the sketch for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang etc um, but just a few years ago, before both of them passed away, they made contact as a result of my research. Uh, and be, uh, Miss Coles, as she was to him, uh, said to him, what happened to him? What happened, you know, I knew that he did exceedingly well. I think she always regretted not marrying him, actually. <laughs> she had a pretty nice uh, classic car. So he went on to do very, very well for himself in Hollywood. 
appears then by the middle of the wartime, and this I think is an extraordinary and very important strand, some, yes, did stay within the Pioneer Corps and eventually went back to Germany and did vital work alongside those that served in regular fighting forces. In 1942, the British government allowed some of them, or they sussed out those that would be suitable for special duties. It's a very, very important part of the story because the government finally woke up, we've got fluent German speakers, uh, we can drop them behind enemy lines, and there was an Austrian contingent, of which Walter Freud was one of them. Uh, they formed a special commando unit, some of you might know, X troop, X meaning unknown, you can have a Belgian commando unit, a French commando unit, you cannot have a German commando unit, so they called it X, X for unknown, and around a hundred of those were selected from the Pioneer Corps and went on to do incredibly dangerous missions. They did not serve together, they served, I interviewed some of them, they served in different commando units, Royal Marine Commandos, and they had, apart from Bomber Command, the highest losses in the wartime. They lost about 20% of their, um, their numbers. So those, what I find extraordinary was they'd all volunteered for the Pioneer Corps. They put their life on the line and they gave their lives for the country that had saved them. Some of them did not survive the landings in Sicily and Italy. Uh, there are some incredible stories amongst them. Some of those did not survive D-Day and the memorial to them is in Abu Dhabi in Wales, which is where they'd had their little base and they went up to Scotland and trained and stuff. So that's X Troop and Wilfred Lee on the right uh, ended up in a very distinct, in the Coldstream Guards ultimately, but he was also for a short time in the Black Watch. And his son made contact and said to me, um, my father served, but I don't want to know anything. But I said, well, I need some, you know, some stuff for the book. Will you talk to me? No, 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 he wouldn't talk to me. I said, fine. And then I got another phone call and he said, I found a little diary. You can have a look at it. You can have it to, to, just for, you know, for your research, but I don't want to talk about it. I said, fine, that's fine. Looked at this diary. It was incredible. Just one or two entries in this diary and I then worked with the official war diaries and he did make contact again and he said, have you, what have you found out? And for him, for the son, it explained the trauma that he'd grown up with because both his mother and his father committed suicide in the 1950s. His father as a result of what he'd seen on the front line and his mother because she'd been hidden, one of the hidden children. And psychologically, it had completely, uh, she'd never recovered. And he'd had an extraordinarily brave war fighting on the front line at which most of, I knew from the war diaries, most of the officers uh, died on the front line and he saw horrific things that he never recovered from uh, and very very brave man and now he could feel proud at what his father had done uh, because of just a little bit of probing. On the left uh, X troop, the little group of X troop, yeah, they look like tough commandos. They were the first ones apparently to have silent boots so that they could go around stealthily at night. On the right is Anton Walter Freud, who had, as I mentioned earlier, been transported to Australia. It was Virginia Woolf's um, husband, Leonard Woolf, who wrote to Parliament and said, this is ridiculous that a grandson of Freud should be transported to Australia as a dangerous a bit exaggerated, enemy alien. But eventually, yeah, he joined the Pioneer Corps in Ilfracombe in 1941. There were around 300 of them that were brought back on a ship uh, from Australia, joined the Pioneer Corps and went on to make distinguished contribution. So those pioneers that I interviewed, <coughs> I was just really expecting them to talk about some of the life and the colour in North Devon or in Kitchener camp, wherever they had trained, some of their experiences in France and evacuation. And then, of course, when I started, many of them would say in the little cafe where they used to meet, a group of them, no, no, you don't want my story, I didn't do anything very much. No, no, that's fine, but can I come and have a cup of tea and talk to you about your days in Ilfracombe? Because I was born in Ilfracombe. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you about Ilfracombe. They were funny days, and then they talk, you know, the usual stuff. So then, after I got to know them, I say, well, 
He said, well, you didn't stay in the Pioneer Corps. What do you mean, stay in the Pioneer Corps? Oh, I went in the Royal Armoured Corps, for example, and I did a biography from Dachau to D-Day of Willie Field, for example, who spent 11 months fighting on the front line, having started out in the Pioneer Corps. And he was the sole survivor when his tank was hit at Nijmegen incredible stories and he said at the end of the war he was chosen to be in the victory parade past Churchill and he said there was me a little German Jewish refugee who was proudly um, you know around along that well I want to say Champs-Élysées whatever it is in German <laughs> in Berlin look where he'd come from thank you look where he'd come from uh, and and you know that story. so he said you know I was uh, in the Royal Armour Corps. And then he said, of course, I said, OK, so you were demobilised and when did you marry Judy? No, 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 we weren't demobilised for another, and this is probably very familiar with you, we weren't demobilised for another couple of years. And this was the story that I was getting. But what did you do? And again, this is a really important strand of the refugee history, that those early Pioneer Corps soldiers, not all of them, but a lot of them fought in dangerous missions, but those that were still in the Pioneer Corps joined the others and they were involved in the reconstruction of post-war Germany and Austria. Some of the lawyers that started out in the Pioneer Corps were taken to Vienna uh, so that they could help to reconstitute the laws in Vienna. It wasn't just a matter of overturning the Nazi laws apparently. And as you can see from here, uh, this is taken by one of the, well, taken by one of the, uh, of the Royal Army Corps, Eight Hussars, when they captured one of the flags and draped it over their tank as a kind of victory thing. And Geoffrey Perry, who ended up capturing Lord Haw Haw at the end of the war, said, when they crossed back into Germany, he said, we liberated France, we liberated Belgium, and we invaded Germany. When we crossed back over, there was that goosebump feeling of returning to Germany, not um, well, still not having British nationality, British citizenship, but in British Army uniform, and they felt British, even though they didn't have that piece of paper. The moment they put on their uniform in the Pioneer Corps, they said to me, we felt British, and nobody questioned that. They had that deep loyalty. They also had a feeling that they were never, ever going back. And I said, but if once Germany was defeated, didn't you think you might go back? And they said, no, we had a deep feeling, and, and a lot of them said that, that we would never go back. And as you can see on the left, that's the war crimes trials in Essen, of which, for example, if any of you know, uh, Lord Peter Eden was involved in that. So the refugees were absolutely vital for the reconstruction, as I said, uh, of post-war Europe and bringing stability. And I argue in one of my books that without them, and I raise that question, could we have reconstituted uh, stability and peace in um, post-war Europe? without them and they're involved I'm nearly coming to the end of my slides I've got a couple left just to give you uh, an overview really so at the end of the war they're involved in interpretive stuff in Nuremberg in restoring democracy to the media whether it's newspapers or um, radio broadcasts absolutely vital they're also impounding key documents they're on the hunt for Nazi war criminals for example the commandants of the concentration camps if you have a look in some of the documentaries they'll say oh yes the British captured Rudolf Huss for example I was lucky enough to interview uh, Hans Alexander before he just weeks before he passed away he was involved in a little team that captured Rudolf Huss and of course who were they yes they were in the British Army but his team was solely German Jewish refugees who changed their names to English sounding names and so we owe a great debt to them uh, for what they did uh, in that at the end of the war and I just want to sort of round up really with a very special group that I've been involved in actively in the last two to three years Fritz Lustig who's been on television quite a lot actually passed away last year uh, second above the women one two three four two four sixth in he said to me when I was doing all this and he answered about the Pioneer Corps had lots of material 
He said, I never fought on the front line and I always felt guilty because I wanted to fight proper and I was never given the chance. And I was safe in a little house in Buckinghamshire uh, with fellow secret listeners and we were listening in and bugging the conversations of German prisoners of war. And some of them on that photograph were involved in bugging the prisoners at Trent Park. In fact, uh, Hitler's highest commanders at Trent Park from 1942 uh, were being eavesdropped by the German Jewish refugees. And these three sites, Trent Park, Latimer House and Wilton Park, Trent Parks near Cockfosters, have now been recognised by Historic England, and I quote, as of national and international significance, on a par with Bletchley, the code-breaking for the war. Incredible legacy. And every single one of those men the women, the refugee women that were involved in vital work, but every single one of those men started out in the Pioneer Corps. And their legacy very nearly disappeared. And we are now creating just a little montage I've done uh, of the refugees, ex-refugees, uh, that worked as secret listeners. We now have one surviving secret listeners. The eyewitnesses really are dying. Um, second in, Fritz on the left, uh, then there's Eric Mark. And just to, to mention that Eric is going to appear on a BBC One documentary in the week of the 6th of November at Trent Park. It's not public knowledge yet. It's no, we've got no transmission date, but it's home front heroes. And you will hear his extraordinary story from pioneer to secret listener. And the point of that is to say that these 10,000 largely Jewish refugees made a huge contribution to this country. It smashes the myth that Jews don't fight. It's also a, a very important part of Holocaust education. And I just want to finish by saying and I stand to be corrected and it does bother me that there is not a single memorial to these men and women who fought for Britain. And I think it's time to change that. And uh, hopefully that might happen. But what also makes me sad is the fact that I think when it happens, I really hope it happens, they should have a proper memorial, a proper national memorial. I doubt we'll have a single veteran left uh, to be there at the unveiling. So whatever your background stories, and I finish with a quote from Felix Shaft, he went on to work uh, uh, from the Pioneer Corps as a translator at the London Cage, a bit of a dark history of interrogation uh, in Kensington Palace Gardens, a different story, but he said in his lifetime that it's really important that we become guardians of memory. And I guess for you, and for me as a historian, for you as second generation, it is really, and the next generations, who else is gonna do it? We do have to be guardians of memory. Thank you.